on today's show, could Apple make a $500 MacBook? That's right, it could be feasible, we are going to talk about it later in the show, but first, the headlines. Oh yeah, I'm okay, Dave, all that stuff. You know the drill. Mint Mobile, a mobile phone carrier who I believe sponsor a number of tech channels, has been involved in a data breach. And the customers whose data was involved in the breach were vulnerable to having their numbers ported to another network. Now that's bad enough in itself, but Mint also admits that some account information, like names, phone numbers, email addresses, passwords, and we can only assume these passwords are in an unencrypted state because they didn't mention that they were encrypted, and account numbers could also have been easily accessed, which is really a pretty bad day for those users, especially the ones that use the same password and email combination on other accounts, which, yes, it's a bad idea, but we know that people do, but it's also made far worse when they also have access to your phone number and can port that to another network, so if you use two-factor authentication for anything, you're probably not having a great day. And next, the first M1 battery test lasted so long Apple thought the indicator was buggy. That's the name of an article over on Apple Insider from the weekend, and I have to say, I think it pretty much tells the whole story. Bob Borchers, the VP of Worldwide Product Marketing, told Tom's Guide, when we saw that first system and then you sat there and played with it for a few hours and the battery didn't move, we thought, oh man, that's a bug, the indicator's broken. Tim Millett, the VP of Platform Architecture, said, if someone else could build a chip that was actually going to deliver better performance inside that enclosure, what's the point? Why would we switch, he said. And so, for my chip architects, that was the target. But perhaps the most exciting part of this interview, Millet acknowledged that gamers, for one, want yet more power. Of course, you can imagine the pride of some of the GPU folks and imagining, hey, wouldn't it be fun if this hits a broader set of those really intense games? He said, it's going to be a natural place for us to be looking, working closely with our metal team and our developer team. We love the challenge. That is coming directly from Apple, and although they don't comment on future products, they've just said very, very clearly that Apple is interested in higher performance gaming. That sounds like AAA gaming to me. Why is nobody else talking about this? But there we go. That's that news story for you. And before we move on, I just wanted to point out before the main event that last week I asked you if pizza or pasta was the best because of one of the iCave Answers questions. And both uh, is not a valid answer, guys. Which one? I expect better from you as a collective next time. Anyway, moving on. And of course, the correct answer is pizza. But let's go on to our main event. So welcome back to Speculation Land, where Apple's lawyers can't touch us. It's a beautiful place for one and all, populated with $500 MacBooks. So why do I have this mildly insane idea in my head? Well, if you look at Apple's non-Mac lines, we have the iPhone with the 12 at $799. Okay, $699 if you want to include the Mini, but nobody does. And then we have the iPhone SE at $399. We have the flagship Apple Watches at $399 and the Series 3 from $199. We have the iPad Pro at $799 and the iPad from $329. So I definitely think, and I've said this before, there is a definite marketplace for lower priced Macs. And this could even be competing with Chromebooks and stuff like that because Apple isn't paying for their chips from anyone else anymore. Speaking of chips, Apple have included in the past the A10X in a $149 Apple TV box, and the M1 is basically the successor to that chip via the A12X, but the A10X also sold in far smaller quantities than the M1, so the cost per unit on M1 is almost certainly lower. So I think we'll focus on using the M1 to power this system as it makes a lot of sense in terms of the engineering that's already done. We also know that the MacBook Air itself is due for an update. Based on the latest information that we have, it looks like Apple is planning to refresh it in the first part of 2022 with the M2 and an all new design and at an event that we're expecting to see the latest iteration of the iPhone SE, Apple's lowest priced iPhone. So it wouldn't be a bad place to introduce the lowest priced MacBook ever either. And in terms of what we've seen, these are some of the renders that have been done for us by Orchard Digital. That's right, not Apple tomorrow. He's changed his name. More on that later. So other than using that processor that contains basically everything that you need, including your GPU, neural engine, unified memory, and all the other gubbins that Apple puts in there, where can we save some money or drop non-essential features in order to make a lower priced MacBook? Let me know down in the comments the areas you'd be happy to compromise to for a $500 MacBook 
And also bear in mind here that the 7 core GPU would almost certainly be the only option making the most of those chips that didn't quite make the cut for the iPad Pro or MacBook Pro or iMac models. So first of all, we can save a little money on the keyboard by dumping the backlight. That's gonna save a bit of complexity in the production and if nothing else, remove a feature that people like but don't always need. This is the perfect kind of thing that we can remove while keeping a nice functional system. While we're at it with the keyboard, probably taking out the Touch ID sensor will save a little chunk of cash too. And although that's really helpful in terms of unlocking with biometrics, if you've got an Apple Watch, you can also use that as your unlock method for this MacBook. And I think at this point, if we're going for as cheap as possible in terms of sale price, allowing people to use other accessories as an unlock seems to make sense. Now moving up to the display, if you're looking for a lower price system, the P3 color gamut and true tone displays are probably things that you can do without while keeping the retina resolution and the brightness. Now given that the 2022 MacBook Air is rumored to be getting a mini LED display now too, this is still a really great display, especially versus uh, 1080p PC laptops, but it wouldn't have all the bells and whistles of the flagship notebooks from Apple. The onboard storage could probably also be reduced a little bit. 128 gigs does sound tight, but it's actually surprisingly usable, especially if you make the most of cloud services like iCloud with the vast majority of videos and music also being streamed these days rather than hoarded in your onboard storage. And if you need to access more, at least a USB-C Thunderbolt is fast, so you can throw in some external storage down the line if you need to. The 720p potato that's where the FaceTime camera should be uh, will probably also have to stay while the newly designed MacBooks and MacBook Pros look like they're moving on to 1080p cameras finally. So I think that's a decent amount of savings but if we look back to the original MacBook as Apple did with their new iMacs with white display surrounds the first MacBooks were actually those iconic white polycarbonate ones. Apple did also make them in black at the time, although they were a lot less popular because they didn't stand out as much, and as such they're actually more sought after these days uh, because of their rarity. So perhaps just like when the iPhone 5C was released, these could be unapologetically plastic. Now I will grant you that this last one is probably a step too far for Apple, but they are also going all in on colours right now, and this could be an easy way to achieve that on a budget. So let me know down in the comments exactly what you think of this idea for a $500 MacBook Air SE. We'll call it a MacBook Air SE, it could just be called the MacBook, but let me know your thoughts down in the comments. And before we go, we have a couple more things to do. So we have Frank Petrie Jr.'s setup. Uh, he says, let's be honest, this is what everyone's desk looks like before they take the pictures. And yeah, I've got to admit, mine is a bit of a mess too, um, especially in this area that's off camera, because I built myself a new kind of filming area over here. So look forward to that. And also, uh, Apple Tomorrow, who has been doing our renders for a very long time, has rebranded. Uh, he now goes under the name of Orchard Digital, which I helped him with a little bit of the graphics and the logo style typeface stuff. Uh, I'm a little bit quicker on Photoshop than him, but when it comes to Blender, Render Boy is the man. So all the renders you've seen in today's show are from Orchard Digital. You should definitely go and check them out on Twitter. The YouTube channel is out there as well, where he puts all of the animation stuff, and it looks very, very good. So go and check him out. Now, this is where we would move on to iCave Answers, but we're going to do a separate show today because we're already running a little bit over time for what I would like to do for this show. So join me later on today where we will do iCave Answers. Don't forget to hit the notification bell so you don't miss that later on. And you can only actually ring that if you've subscribed. Fun story. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.